Welcome to the Femsplainers. I'm Danielle Crittenden and I'm Christina Hoff Summers. Woohoo! You're back in the studio. I'm back. It's a new year. It's a new era. So how are you, Christina? You have not been on the podcast since, I guess, sometime late last year. And how are you feeling in this, the Biden era? The Biden era. I'm, I'm happy to be in this new era. We can have arguments uh, that I've been wanting to have. And every time I would tweet anything that relatives of mine thought would undermine Biden's candidacy, I was told, take that down. Don't say that. Don't do any. Don't. Do. And I'd say, but, but these, these are real issues. We still have to worry about the wokes. And I, you know, I'm worried about right wing populism and left wing populism. Why? But I wasn't permitted by certain family members to do. I blocked you were being I, censored. You were being I, I censored blocked, by your own family. I blocked my children. <laughs> <laughs> you were being deplatformed by, by your own, own family. Wow. So we're in a new era and now let the games begin. Well, it is funny because we've done a, a couple of a past couple of shows, one with Caitlin Flanagan, one with Ann Applebaum, and we've been sort of talking in, in each show just about the division and how to find unification in this, you know, blah, blah, blah world where everybody's so divided. Um, and we've talked a lot about, can we call it insurgency on the right? And then we get a lot of pushback from our listeners who say, ah, oh, you're always going after Trump supporters. But I think the point is that I'm that some people get more agitated about what's gone on in the right. And some people have a default sensitivity to that, which is going on on the left. So even when we had January 6th and disturbing as, as I found that and trying to heat, trying to sort of tap down all this conspiracy theory stuff that's all over social media, uh, that's the thing that gets me very agitated. There are other people who are still and remain much more agitated about woke, well, about I'm agitated censorship by of both. the right. Fact, I see them is connected. And I think that the, the violence in the early summer normalized a certain kind of behavior and was a kind of permission. And, and I also think it's all pandemic related. I think that the acting out, the frenzy, the hysteria, that it's, there's a connection between the riots and the insurgency. However, it's a new era. Biden is there. And, um, I'm not even I mean, I I don't want to talk about the Trump impeachment, but I sort of look forward to not having. Mr. Trump in my head all the time. Right. And the, the Trump issue and that we can just. We have normalcy, we have sanity. Now we can have more, uh, more straightforward arguments. However, I am trying to cure myself of. A, I don't say a Twitter addiction, but. I, I downloaded an app that helps you with doom scrolling. There's an app for doom scrolling? There's an app for doom scrolling. And there are even a couple of people you can follow and they will watch you. And if they notice it, they'll stage an intervention. So doom scrolling is you. Wait, so you, you're, you're hiring your own watchers? Like what You is don't it, hire, do? you just follow them. They do it for you voluntarily. What, what, so tell me how this works. So, so, you, you're, so what I do have a tendency to do. And if others do this, let me know. We are, we're, we're a misunderstood suffering group of people mm -hmm. where you, you go in the morning, I usually start out and you sort of go through Twitter and you're sort of looking for something that makes you mad. You love to be set off. I realize. Remember, remember when you would do your weekly rants? Yes. And you, cause I you could like one, I could do one right now <laughs> about, about what? just about <laughs> reactions to the queen's gambit. This is a show on TV about this, this chess, chess player, player, female chess player. You know, prodigy. Which is queued up. I have not yet watched it, but I realize, as always, I will be the last person to watch one it's of these shows. It's very good. It's very good. And it was just delightful to watch. And it didn't, didn't give in to the cliches. I expected that we'd see an evil stepmother, and, and not to be spoiler alert, but a bit of a spoiler alert, not to see an evil stepmother again. And her foster mother and there was an elderly man, older man that helped her. And it just, I thought, Oh, here comes the child molester. <laughs> and he turned out just to be a nice man, a wonderful man. And the young men she competed against, there was a little bit of, Oh, a girl shouldn't be here. But once they saw how good she was, they loved her and helped her. And this created a big 
storm of opposition from gender activists who objected to the movie because it didn't in, in, engage in these cliches and that it was strayed from you know the standard storylines and and I it just irritated me that it kept being attacked because it wasn't standard issue feminist griping. Well, I you know I. I yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, but anyway, that, I was so, so you to went go to the, on a rant. I was, no, no. I was going to go back to doom scrolling. Yeah. So, what is doom scrolling? It's just you go on social media, particularly Twitter, and you you're not aware you're doing this, but you're kind of you know which things do you pay attention to? And I tend to pay attention to well, one thing is if somebody's being bullied unfairly, mm -hmm. and usually it's someone that's said something that's politically incorrect, and then they get trashed, or maybe it wasn't even incorrect, and. I, I, and so I get, I'll get in the middle of that <laughs> for some reason. And then so you're not even it, Irish, you, you, you know, you don't even need an Irish in you. I need to be what that this, makes me so. No, is this like a, a, a private fighter? Can I join it? Or, you yeah. Know. Yeah. I get into I get in the middle of fights and then um, or I'll find something about the pandemic. Right now, I doom scroll about about schools and I'm very upset about the position that some unions, teachers unions have taken, even after in Virginia, there's a union that says even after schools, children are, even after the teachers are vaccinated, they don't think schools should open. We have to wait till the children are vaccinated. Well, that'll be forever. Well, that'll be th that the whole politics of opening schools is, is such a mess. So um, if I see something like that while doom scrolling, then right. I will, I will. So I'm trying not to do it. Yeah. I don't have to enter every controversy. But, you know, it's very entertaining. <laughs> well, this is I, I, it's part of the new era. It, one of the things I've decided to do is not to listen. To, I, I don't watch cable news, but I will often oh. have often had it on in the background. Like, you know, when I'm doing my makeup or something, that's where I listen to the news. And, and it's been and I never used to listen to cable news before, you know, the Trump era. I, I don't like it anymore. And I, I, so I've sort of like, I'm consciously not listening to the news. I'm very consciously not going on Twitter. And maybe that is a good thing of this time, as you say, that we're going back to some kind of, some idea, or at least attempting to crawl back to some idea of normalcy, um, where we don't feel that every second if we don't look at the news, something terrible has happened. Right. Or some, something is going on out there, some battle, and you want to go in and get become part of it. You don't, you don't have to live that way. When it, a few weeks ago, or I don't know, I, get, I lose track of time now, but when they came down and got rid of Parler and they were coming down on social media, I thought, Maybe they'll take down Twitter. <laughs> you were for it. And I, I was for it. I mean, it's, it's I don't have the strength to quit it, but <laughs> if they just took it away. Right. right. It wasn't well, well as you said, I mean, just taking that Twitter mic away from Trump has had, I likened it to having a neighbor who had this dog that just barked all I the time. You said that somewhere, and I thought it was a great analogy. <laughs> and then the dog moves away, and you go, oh. My God, it's quiet. Yeah. I can sleep in. I'm not being woken up at six a.m. by a barking. No, I've dog. already noticed a change. Yeah, but but um, anyway, but but now we're going to uh, I, the the trouble is uh, nothing is going away. Um, that we, I, I keep trying to live have magical thinking that just because it's a new year and a new administration that we are. And, and I think the hunger to be normal again is huge, whatever it meant before. But we, don't you think that hunger to be normal is going to lead us to be less just uh, contentious? And aren't people ready to calm down? I don't know. I mean, you, you look, it's, it's like everybody is just repositioning themselves into the same trenches. And I'm trying to, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm like you, I'm trying to just sort of stay in the middle. I'm trying not to be political. I'm trying not to be ideological. And I, I, I feel like I can get equally mad at Christina oh, brought yes, her phone I in did. and she brought in Izzy is sitting quietly on my lap, but we might be interrupted speaking of barking dogs, but uh, I can be equally mad at things that violence and rioting on the left as I can be 
about it on the right. Like this, I guess what I'm saying is that impulse, your default setting as to what upsets you, what makes you angrier. And it does seem that people are very naturally migrating back to the trenches they were in and people on the right getting more upset about things done on the left and vice versa. And that is just, imagine a line that we are never going to cross um, until something until something breaks that dynamic. And I, know, I thought January 6th may have broken that dynamic, but I well, don't think it did. what could break the dynamic, I think, is, I just wish we had a politics that was focused on problem solving. And we, we have some serious, obviously, the pandemic and why people can't come together, members of Congress, and try to address the issue that sets me off is how impossible the it is to get a vaccine. And in, in in Maryland, we're way at the bottom in terms of. Um, you guys are up there with Canada. Is Canada bad too? <laughs> Canada's terrible. Canada's and it really seems messed to be. I'm not sure. I don't want to presume to know what happened. Uh, and I think there are many, many reasons, but for some reason, we were very fast in getting the cure and very slow in the delivery of the vaccine. And there seems, it seems to be that a lot of pointless regulation is implicated, just bad choices and not doing what Israel did, which was just give it to as many people as they could, starting with age groups and going down. But that's, it's also, I also feel that we're in, even we're, I mean, we're all impatient, obviously. But the once they get it going, it's going to go fast, really fast, and and more more vaccines, more variations are coming online. And David, David is my husband. David is uncharacteristically optimistic, which he never is, as you know. He's like always very pessimistic. But on this one, he thinks not only will it go much faster than we think, but people are going to go into a big party. So this whole it's going to be like the roaring 20s or something that people are just going to finally come out and 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 maybe this contention that we're talking about and these trenches and this madness is a byproduct of being locked up. But um, um, before we go on, um, we're going to bring on Katie Herzog, which is very exciting. I'm very excited. And you kind of know her, right? You Well, I don't know her. I've just followed her for a long time. I think I've, we've changed emails occasionally. Um, I love her show, Locked and Reported, and I just I I just adore her because she's a free thinking. I want to say young person, but you know, she's to me, young. She's, she's very in her, young. She's thirties, in her right. mid thirties. I think she's thirty seven, and um, she, she she's not predictable. And also, I have a very soft spot in my heart for former leftists who are still kind of lefty and counterculture, uh, but who reject the rigidities of the left. And she's right there in that sweet spot. Well, also she's, she's been, as, and I want to get more of her personal story because she was drummed out. I mean, she was out there in what, Portland? No, uh, Seattle. Seattle, right. In, in the in, lesbian scene. She's, uh, you couldn't get more wokey, lefty. And she was part of it. Those were her Katie. friends. Those but, were her friends. She wrote an article, and she'll tell us a bit about it, uh, researching the trans issue and just asked questions, raised questions. Well, about was, she wrote about when someone detransit, when somebody changes their mind and wants to come and back. And you're not allowed to go there. Yeah. And then she became one of the most hated people in Seattle, you know, from among in the progressive community. The progressive community, when it gets it gets ang- much angrier at one of their own. Right than at a right winger. And so Katie just became right target. because it's one of your own species, whereas the as, as the problem today is when anybody on the quote unquote other side is is an alien, is just an alien. You there. expect the worst. They're diabolical. Yeah. But someone on your own side, it's a, a little bit like the treatment. I think like Barry Weiss, the way yeah. she was treated, yeah. uh, Katie, Jesse Single, her her co-host on Blocked and Reported. She wrote an article. It, she worked for The Stranger. And then she'd write whatever she wanted, but then um, she was subject. I don't think they had a Slack channel, but it, whatever they had in terms of a you know gossip network, she was 
just constantly put down by colleagues and eventually lost her job. I don't know. During yeah, the pandemic. She, she did. She did. And then and then she started this podcast um, before we bring her on. I just wanted to. Um, Christina, you'll appreciate this. So remember when we used to be <laughs> remember that long ago time pre pandemic, we record in the studio of your think tank, AEI downtown in Washington. And we always had a wonderful research assistant. We had Ella. We had Ella and, and, and we'd often have them on. And, we, and they were always these wonderful, very young Gen Zers who had wonderful perspectives and come. So once we stopped going to AEI, of course, we lost our, our research help. So I've been trying to find an intern for the Femsplainers podcast. By the way, if you're interested, contact at femsplainers.com. We're interviewing right now. But I've interviewed a number of people, of young women, and I am just staggered by how many impressive candidates have no idea how to conduct a job interview. And I thought it could be helpful to just say a couple of the things, the common mistakes that they're doing wrong, because- I Okay, rule number one, research the place that's interviewing you. Be an expert on everything they've ever done. Well, this is one so of the things. So they know about the femsplainers? No, and- well, so, so we've had a couple who, I put it out on our social media. So we had a couple who came through there and um, and I had just stress. I've had some very good interviews, but I would say by and large, uh, people have uh, applied. They've, they've done a cursory listen. Maybe they've even just looked at the iTunes menu Maybe they've listened to one. They have no idea what the podcast is about. And one of the things I specified was a knowledge of social media, because as you know, a woman of my age should not be running our Instagram account, let alone the rest of social media. Maybe someone of my age should be on Facebook, but not, <laughs> not Instagram, let alone TikTok. TikTok. But, I want to go on but, TikTok. But they hadn't looked at the social media. One person started to look at it as I was talking to her. I said, what do you think of our social media? Oh, wait, one second. And started to pull it up in Research the interview. Research the company you're going to work for. And also, you can go online and look at how to, how to conduct yourself in a job interview. Go online and look at the well, advice the that's biggest, given. The biggest, I can give you one, whoever is listening to this and wants advice, I'll give you one piece of advice that we gave our kids to that this will serve you well through life. When you are going into a job interview, the employer is not interested in how good this job will be for you and how this job will help your skills. What the employer wants to know is what you can do for them and what, what you will bring to the job and this position. So I've spoken to so many people who have said, and this would be really great for my resume. And I really wanted to learn about podcasting and blah, 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 blah. No. I want to hear why you are the person I should hire and what you're going to bring to this and, and to listen in the interview also as to what that person is asking. So it's a, it's not, so just if you go through life saying, it's not about me, it's about you, you will, <laughs> this will do you very, very well in job interviews. Anyway, we're still hoping to, by the time this airs, have found someone, but we're looking for a part-time intern. It is paid. And, um, it's part-time, 10, 12 hours a week. Contact at femsplainers.com. Send your resume and remember, it's about us. Okay, let's, uh, <laughs> let's bring on Katie. Let's face it, cooking at home day after day and trying to eat healthily is difficult at the best of times. But during a pandemic, ugh, getting everything you need to make meals is complicated right now. But with Freshly, it's simple. Freshly offers chef-made, nutrient-packed, delicious meals delivered fresh to your door. No cooking is required. Your meals arrive prepared and fresh every week, so you can keep your fridge stocked and skip the trip to the store. Ordering is easy. Visit Freshly.com and choose from over 30 delicious, satisfying, better-for-you meals like steak peppercorn or sausage baked penne or their chicken pesto bowl. And Freshly can fit your lifestyle with a variety of plans and meals to pick from that work for your dietary needs, preferences, tastes, and family size. 
I've been dieting this past month. And I can tell you that not having to think about what I'm going to eat and opening my fridge and there's a meal and knowing it's healthy is fantastic. And now you can try Freshly for just $6.16 per meal. So stop searching the internet for quote unquote healthy foods near me every night and start living life freshly. Your meals are always delivered fresh, never frozen, and are ready to heat and enjoy in just three minutes. With new meals added each week, Freshly brings the convenience of chef-made, nutritionist-designed classics right to your kitchen. So right now, Freshly is offering our listeners $40 off your first two orders when you go to Freshly.com slash Femsplain. Make eating better your New Year's resolution and get a special limited offer. Go to Freshly.com slash Femsplain for $40 off your first two orders. So try Freshly now and for a limited time, yes, get $40 off your first two orders. Go to Freshly.com slash Femsplain to learn more and to start eating better. Katie, welcome to the Femsplainers. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be on the show. I listen every week and even better, my wife actually listens to your show. So I'm not going to tell her that I'm on it. This is going to be quite the surprise for her. Um, yeah. So thank oh, you for having goodness. me. I'm a huge fan. That's that. That's so kind. Um, so we, um, I, I mean, we've been following your work. Uh, we know that you, you, you just sort of court being canceled, honestly. You, you are so... <laughs> You've been so canceled, you are now uncancelable. <laughs> exactly. How exactly. does that work? How do you do that? I mean, you, you, you went through this. We talked a little bit about what you went through the stranger. Maybe just give us that background that this was your kind of bath of fire, bath of realization of what you were doing. But you were part of a, a snug lesbian community in Seattle and, and then all hell broke loose. Well, not exactly a lesbian community because nobody calls themselves lesbians anymore. Well, that's also um, what I so, want to talk about. Right. <laughs> Vanishing right. endangered species. Right. I'm the last one. Uh, me and a couple of six-year-old women. Um, <laughs> so before I uh, was a, a staff writer at The Stranger, I was a freelancer. And in 2017, I wrote this piece on, the de on detransitioners, a concept that I'm sure your audience is familiar with. Uh, but for anybody who isn't, this is people who transition from one gender to the other and then transition back. And then after the piece came out, there was this just massive shitstorm, And I was um, surprised. I thought that I had sort of uh, dotted all of my I's and crossed my T's within the piece. Um, I made sure to get the voices of happily transitioned people within the piece and to make sure that it was very clear to people that detransition is, as far as we know, it is fairly rare, although there isn't really good data on this. Um, and and that the existence of detransitioners doesn't negate the fact that trans people exist, that people do have gender dysphoria. And, and in many cases, it is better, it is best treated with, with transitioning. Um, and so I thought that, you know, by making this clear, nobody will have a problem with this piece. Well, that's not what happened. Um, and there was just a, it, the, the backlash was just really intense. So there was, of course, all of the online stuff, um, as you would expect, but it also was offline. And so people printed up flyers calling the piece transphobic and put them in newspaper boxes all over the city. They put them in the coffee shops around my neighborhood. Um, somebody made stickers, actually three different versions of these stickers and put them up around Seattle. So even today, this is four years later, if I go to Seattle, I'll see stickers with a picture of my face calling me a Nazi. There's another edition that calls me a Jordan Peterson apologist. So that one's the most embarrassing. Um, somebody, uh, somebody, set stacks of the paper on fire and sent it to me. Um, so this was a real, a real baptism by fire. Also, um, Katie, sorry, this... sorry, Katie, sorry to interrupt you, but I loved how you said that being called a Jordan Peterson apologist 
was worse than being called a Nazi. <laughs> I guess in Seattle, Seattle it is. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, go on, go on. And my and what I had done with with Peterson, I'm not actually a fan of Peterson, but what no, I what I, I think is that I don't think that he's a Nazi either. And I had written that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you know, Seattle is just a place where it's politically it's very homogenous. You know, it is as as diverse as you know uh, the DSA convention. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is just it is a difficult place to be uh, to be sort of a a contrarian thinker. And um, that is, you know, not a label I would have even applied to myself before I started working at The Stranger. But there was just a, a really crazy backlash to this piece. And that sort of set the tone for my uh, for my, my tenure at the paper. Um, so I got a staff writer job there pretty soon after that. So in one way, you know, I never would have gotten the staff writing job if not for this piece. And so, and everything that has subsequently happened in my career really is thanks to the backlash. So I should really thank the people who print up the stickers and call me transphobic and a Nazi. I should send them a fruit basket. They've been doing my PR for me for three years and they're quite good at it. It really helps you. And, and your podcast just took off once you, yeah. I don't, you were let go by the stranger mm-hmm. and then started the podcast. It's, it was just a hit from the word go. How do you like being a podcaster? I love it. So I was, uh, I took a voluntary furlough in right after COVID started. If you remember, Seattle was sort of the first city in the US to really get the COVID wave. Um, And the paper immediately uh, started to lose advertisers because businesses were closing down. And so it went into this sort of tailspin, uh, just a, a panic. And so I, um, I emailed my boss and I said, you know, I was sort of thinking like, this would be a nice little sabbatical. And so I emailed him and I said, if you, if you have to do furloughs, I'll be first in line, not thinking that he would actually take me up on it. And then I got a call an hour later, thanking me for my service. Um, so, well, you know, like sort of a shocking it, Google was fired the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Although, yeah. Yeah. Hers was more of a, I think hers was more of a political stand and I just wanted a vacation. Um, (laughs) But but so Jesse Single and I started the podcast really quickly after that. And I absolutely love it. For one thing, I don't have to go anywhere. Not that I would be leaving my house now anyway, for the most part. Um, But, you know, I, I worked with one of the difficulties about working at The Stranger was that In some ways, I was really lucky. I had institutional support. So the bosses liked me. Anybody over 40, they, for the most part, people liked me. My peers, however, thought that I was a literal Nazi. And it's difficult to be in an environment like that. Um, It didn't matter like how many, how many times I could bring, I could bring cookies into the office. People just didn't like me there. Is it like high school or, you know, junior high? Or Congress. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's, it's a, you know, I think, these businesses tend to attract younger people. Um, and The Stranger had, for 30 years, it had been very iconoclastic. It was it was founded by the guy who found it, who created The Onion. It was an incredibly funny, acerbic paper for years and years. And then something changed, you know, and I got there, I got there on the tail end of that. Um, you know, wokeism took over the paper the same way wokeism takes over everything, it seems like. And wokeism isn't really funny. And yeah, um, there goes like, humor. There There goes independent thought and incomes producing and canceling and all of that. It's just a scourge. And you've, but you managed to flourish in that environment because you're clever and you're funny and there's people want that. Well, also you have become bitter. Like the other part of it is you could have also gone the other way and just Mm -hmm. become an insane anti-woke person too, which you've managed not to do. Which is I don't think I've actually changed that much in the past. I mean, I've changed in the sense that, for one thing, after I wrote the piece about detransitioners and there was this massive uh, pushback, mostly coming from people I considered my ideological allies, you know, liberals. And I realized that they were wrong. They were deeply wrong about the piece. They were wrong about me. They were wrong about the data. And I, and I had a realization for the first time in my life that if my side could be wrong about this, what else can we be wrong about? So in that way, it was a very um, enlightening and destabilizing experience to think like, wait a second, what else is going on here? And that can make you something of a, you know, almost a conspiracy theorist. You, you start sort of wondering, like, is the world flat? You know, what can I actually believe? Um, which is something that I've been experiencing over the last couple of years, the less I trust the media. And I don't trust the media anymore. This is not something I would have said four or five years ago, um, but especially the leftist media, because, you know, conservative media, I know, I know, I know the agenda. Um, and mainstream and liberal media, 
is uh, I think they, they hide what the agenda is oftentimes, or at least pretend that there isn't one. So it, it is sort it's of a just their default of mode and they're not aware. I'm, right. I'm amazed at how people, again, we t- I talked earlier about f- problematic family members, problematic <laughs> family members who I've talked to on the phone about something that's going on. And then I know they get their news from the New York Times and NPR. Yep. And they see an entirely different world than I do because I pay attention to both. I, I'm on Twitter and people are sending me things from all across the political spectrum. And it, it's as though they inhabit a different world. Yeah. I, I'm actually going to defend the quote unquote mainstream press because we've had an incredibly difficult story for the past four years. And I know, I, I mean, obviously every news organization has its different agendas, its different politics, but the people who were covering the White House day in, day out, we, we even know those people. They're good people. They were... No, up against no one, a no barrage. One said there aren't good people. No, but they're they're up against a barrage of mistruth day in day out, trying to sort it out. And so, I th- what I get worried about is when we dismiss or talk about the media in this monolithic, it's all putrid, it's all you can't trust it. I think that's very dangerous. I think that's a dangerous way to talk. I, I think you're right about that. It's just that, especially I used to work in public radio, and when I listen to NPR now. I can hear what they're leaving out of the story. Like if they're talking about race in America or if they're talking about police shootings in America, they will never tell you how many non-Black people are killed if they're talking about about police brutality in America. They won't talk about that. And they need to. They need to contextualize uh, these major issues because, of course, people are under the impression in the United States that there are racist police targeting and and murdering black men. Of course, they think that that's what they hear on NPR or whatever every day. If you actually dig into the data, you can see that this isn't true, right? There are uh, black, the the black men are slightly overrepresented when it comes to police shootings. There are more white people killed by police every year. Both of these numbers, I'm talking about unarmed people, both of these numbers are actually incredibly small considering we're a country with 300 and what, 70 million people. You have tens of millions of, of police encounters every year and about 15 unarmed black men are shot by the police every year about 20 white people are right so if they could just contextualize that i think it would it that's what they're not doing um yesterday i read a piece in the in the washington post that was about biden's uh, lgbtq agenda which i for the most part not entirely but for the most part i agree with and i think he's doing some good things and this is not an opinion piece, but the author of this piece says that all of the resistance to, uh, to, to trans issues, things like trans women and women's sports, is coming from the conservative right, that this is a Christian, a Christian agenda. Mm-hmm. That's not true. And what that says to me is that the author of this piece and the editor who edited this piece doesn't actually understand the issue. And so when you start, when you, I'm sure you, you both had this experience, when you know a subject really well and you read about it in the New York Times or the Washington Post or, or hear about it on NPR, and you hear them get things wrong, it is also, it, after that happens, it's hard for me to say, all right, wh- why should I trust you on these other things? So the media is, mon- is not a monolith. You are absolutely correct about this. And there's been some great reporting, especially among uh, about the Trump administration and corruption in the administration over the past four years. And I hope that, uh, you know, White House reporters and political reporters put Biden under as much of a microscope as they did Trump. All of our politicians should be treated that way. But I see ideological reporting everywhere. And so for me, as somebody who was raised raised liberal, has always existed in that space, to realize that that's an agenda has been destabilizing. Um, and it's so in good ways, you know, bad ways and good ways. Right. Well, you never should trust everything you read. Right. And I do believe there's, a, I, I remember I, I was a uh, managing editor at the HuffPost in Canada. And just, I was always amazed at the default setting of young reporters that, that if you came at them with another angle that challenged any of their default settings and they had no idea that they had default settings. I think it's, right. it's sort right. of understanding not questioning anything you think. And, and, you know, right. that's maybe that's a rare quality, but let me, let me go to um, what you said earlier about the decline of lesbianism. And this is a little bit uh, about not honest reporting about what is going on. And as you've experienced talking about the transgender issue 
is maybe even more fraught than talking about race or any other topic right now. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. why is that? Why is that? And and then tell us about why lesbians aren't chic anymore. Because <laughs> well, that's a really good question. They had their chic moment. I remember a very right. chic moment, but it was right. Cool. We Right. We had about six months in 2003. That's right. That is a really good question. You know, part of this, I think, is actual progress, right? Um, a lot of the, the major battles have been fought and won. This is a good thing in terms of, in terms of, 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 uh, of civil rights, of, of human rights. Um, and so this is just sort of, I think, the next evolution, you know, after race and sexuality and, and, and sex. Um, this is just sort of next on the list. And part of that, I think, is because uh, after the... Uh, the success of gay marriage, you had these massive and very well-funded gay rights organizations who didn't say after Ogre Befell in 2015, they didn't say, oh my God, we have, we have accomplished our goal, let's shut down, right? They pivoted, they pivoted to trans rights. And in response to that, it, part of that I think was in response to, uh, you know, right-wing legislatures, conservative legislatures, imposing things like bathroom bills, which are for the most part, very unpopular. And I'm against them personally. So I think there's a couple things going on there. Um, why it has become a sort of third rail in American politics. You know, my explanation for almost everything is that there isn't really a good explanation that this is uh, that this is a, a part of social contagion, um, which is a very unsatisfying explanation for for anything. But it, but it also I think is a is the uh, is one that maybe is played out in both of these cases, um, both the rise of, of sort of trans rights and the decline of, of lesbianism. Um, so to address that, so there's been no polling on on the decline of lesbianism. So what I'm talking about is almost entirely anecdotal. But I came out in, uh, in the early 2000s when I was in college. And when I came out, lesbians did have this sort of brief moment of being, of being hip and cool and, and desirable. This was in the outside of pornography. This was- uh, I remember there the, were like TV shows and there was like the, the, the leather word. jacketed, gorgeous. Yeah. Yes, that was yeah. then. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So I so I was in college then, and and the, the show The L Word was on Showtime, and and yeah. we would go on right. Sunday nights, and we would go to the lesbian bars, and everybody would sit around and watch it. And if you talked during the show, you would get shushed by a dozen lesbians. You know, that's a terrifying experience. Yeah. Um, and and then really soon after that, the came the rise of the queer. And that's a term that has existed since the, since the 90s, but it really didn't enter the popular lexicon until the last 15 years. And I remember distinctly the first time I heard someone refer to themselves as queer was in 2005. And I thought like, what is wrong with you? Why are you calling yourself this? And she's explained it to me. Yeah, because no, yeah, that term was around for a long time as a, as a term right. of derision. Right, right. Although we used um, it in-, in Well, in, or, yeah, no, it was- We used insult, it in junior right. high. But I said someone's I queer. That was like no. A, I had no idea what that. it meant. I had no idea. Right. It was just a term. Right. Just oh, she's a queer. You know, it. it we didn't. We, we knew. It. We knew what it meant. It was ugly. I did not know. Like, yeah. But anyway, but, but, but then yeah. it was sort of embraced. Like we're taking. It was embraced. Forward. Right. And so yes. And so uh, so so that identity it rose in popularity. And and the thing about the term queer is that it's really it's really ambiguous. Right. So. It could mean that you're a lesbian in a monogamous relationship like me, or it can mean that you're, you know, a heterosexual male who's into polyamory. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think as identity politics has also have also uh, risen in American culture, um, you know, a lot of people have embraced a term who historically probably would not have considered to be a to be, you know, what we might con consider a sexual minority. Um, kinksters are now considered queer, things like this. So the term has really, has uh, really crept. Dem, um, dem what is it? There's a sexual identity called demi? demi Demisexual. Sexual, yeah. Which means you, you don't like sex or something? It, no, that's asexual. So that, that's one too. Oh, Demisexual. You only want I don't understand. It means you need to be emotionally attracted to someone before you sleep with, with someone. So that would be for that, that's, that's, that's we call that traditional. That, right. It's called being a woman. A being woman. a woman. It's called being a woman. Well, congratulations, you're, you're now queer. Um, and so, th so that has happened. And then, but at the same time, so you have the rise of queer and sort of the de decline of lesbian. The term lesbian seems stodgy and old and unhip now. But at the same time, you've also had you know, this massive increase in the population of transgender people, um, which can, of course, encompass people who, who have severe gender dysphoria, but it can also, now, it also enc can encompass 
uh, non-binary identities. And that's what I'm really interested in because the non-binary identity, if you talk to, and I've talked to a lot of people who call themselves non-binary because at this point it's uh, all of my former lesbian friends are now all non-binary. Hmm. It's not just about this rejection of lesbianism. It's a, about a rejection of being, being a woman. And I find that really interesting. And I cannot tell you the number of, of women I know, former, I, like even talking about this is fraught because if I refer to them as like former women, there's some bristling at that because people say, no, I've always been non-binary or whatever. Um, so let's say females. Um, you know, if I, if I talk to the former females in my life and I say, well, what does it mean to be non-binary? What they often say is, well, I don't feel like a man and I don't feel like a woman. Well, what does that mean? Well, sometimes I like to wear masculine things and sometimes I like to wear feminine things. And to me, I find this to be deeply regressive because the whole point to me of women's liberation and lesbian liberation is to decouple us from these gender roles, right? So the fact that I wear pants and I have short hair and I like to do masculine things does not make me less of a woman. To me, that is progress. It is to say men can be feminine and women can be masculine. And that doesn't mean that we're not women and we're not men. What the non-binary identity does is sort of flip that. And it says, if I am, if I am gender non-conforming, I am not a female. And I hate that. I hate that. I'm, you know, I'm a first, I've been gender non-conforming my entire life. I was a tomboy as a kid. Um, I was one of those kids who, who genuinely looked like a boy. I was a, the only girl in Little League. I was constantly mistaken for a boy. I've been misgendered my whole life. And so I've been fighting this battle my entire life for people to be able to see people like me, see butch lesbians and not think that's a man in the woman's room, right? That, you know, to just have this basic idea that women can be butch and that's fine. But instead you have this generation coming up after mine that says like, oh no, if you're butch, you're not a woman, you're something else. You're trans, you're non-binary. You know what I hate about winter? My hair, it gets dry and lifeless and there's no shine. Or should I say, that's what I used to hate about winter. Because since I've been using my personalized Pro's hair products, I no longer have that problem. My hair looks shiny and healthy no matter what the season. And that's because Pro's knows there is more to you than just your hair type. There's no one size fits all when it comes to shampoo and conditioner. We need products that are suited to our unique needs and don't leave us disappointed. Pro's has given over 1 million consultations with their in-depth hair quiz which is how I got started. And yes, with a quiz. And by the way, you cannot fail this quiz because the quiz asks you things like where you live, your eating habits, and even about exercise. And with their algorithm and over 50 billion formula combinations, pros determined a unique blend of ingredients to treat my exact concerns. And it's not just about shampoo and conditioner. I love my pre-shampoo hair mask and my leave-in conditioner, depending on what kind of day I may be facing. I also love the wooden hairbrush I ordered, which has real boar bristles. It's also personalized with my initials. No one's borrowing that brush without me knowing it. And if you're not 100% positive pros is the best hair care you've had, they will take the products back, no questions asked. Pros is the healthy hair regimen with your name all over it. Literally, my name is all over my shampoo bottles. Take your free in-depth hair quiz and get 15% off your first order today. Go to pros.com slash femsplain. That's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash femsplain for your free in-depth hair quiz and 15% off. You'll love it. I promise you. You're so right that it is reactionary. Right. It's almost as if, well, we're going to rigidly define what it means to be a woman or a man. And if you don't feel that way, then we'll give you a different Right. Label. It's very cartoonish. Right. Cartoonish yes. and right. Iranian. I have read that the, yes. uh, it, the, the radical Muslims in Iran, the Ayatollahs, they actually encourage transitioning because they can't stand the idea of someone defying the stereotypes of the sex. There's right. It's a, wrong. And so it's illegal to be a homosexual, but you can get gender reassignment surgery early. It's it's it's, a, you know, it's a way of basically masking homosexuality. Um, and, you know, this non-binary thing. Why haven't more people realize this? This is such a scam against against lesbians, against gays. 
Well, Andrew Sullivan pointed out he when he, he if you remember Christine when he came on the podcast making this point that being homosexual means I'm attracted to men. Right. And if you're telling me that I am somehow a bigot by not being attracted to a former oh, yeah. woman who calls right. herself a man, right. you have completely erased homosexuality. Right. And it's me. coming from the left. So right. it used right. to be that, that like, right, this, uh, I wrote about this in, in the piece that I wrote for Andrew's newsletter, but the term lesbian has become such a, so taboo that there were these in Portland for, of course, it's always in Portland. In Portland, they had a, um, a, a, a monthly dance party called temporary lesbian bar. And in part of their iconography, they had a labrys, which is this, it's this double headed ax. It's this old, uh, old lesbian symbolism. And um, they were accused of, of, trans woman exterminationism, whatever that means, <laughs> and forced to apologize. And you do not see this, this hand wringing in gay male spaces, right? So lesbianism is bad because it is considered uh, exclusionary of trans people. You, don't, you do not see you know, gay men's bathhouses hand wringing, having these fights about whether or not people with vaginas sh or men with vaginas should be allowed in their, in their gay male bathhouses. It doesn't happen, but it does happen. And anytime you have a woman only space, it happens. Well, that's in, in women only spaces, there's always going to be more policing but, and gossiping right. and, you know, sort of intolerance. But you're right. It's almost like the homosexual community being maybe male. They just say, OK, we're not getting into any of this. Right. And it, this is all a female problem. It's not. It, there are part. there are some cases, but it's just way more pronounced in, uh, in in women's spaces. Well, one of the things I want to ask you, and I always have this feeling with when we talking about transgender subjects, it's like, is it really that large? Is it really that big a deal? I mean, maybe what some tiny percentage is this way and go for it. That's great. And yet the issue just seems to loom larger and larger. And then totally. you had this um, in your article, you found that you did a, you mentioned a 2017 survey from GLAAD that found that 12% of millennials identify as gender non-conforming or transgender. And then in 2019, Pew Research found that one in three members of Gen Z knows someone who goes by gender neutral pronouns. And um, we had Abigail Schreier on the uh, podcast um, last summer and she, her book, which was important, got shoved into the conservative uh, section of the bookstore, but was talking about how just this rash of young women, you talk about a social contagion, who have decided, and maybe they would have become lesbians, but so many of these girls, they may have developed eating disorders. I mean, part of the insecurity of being young women, we seem to to take it out upon ourselves, you know, in adolescence, that whatever it is, we'll start cutting, we'll have eating disorders. And now, in many cases, uh, these young women are deciding that they must be trans um, and they and OK, again, fine, go with that if that makes you feel better, except that they are now taking hormones, puberty blockers, considering very drastic surgery. Um, and then I was, I was telling Christina, we were looking for an intern for our podcast. And one of the women I interviewed who goes to a large school, a prominent school, I won't say which school it is, but before COVID, she said when she was in her dorm, virtually every girl on her dorm floor was taking some sort of hormone or pu puberty block and, and walking around having this image that they're non-binary or whatever it is. So it's obviously gone beyond the genuine cases, if I can call them that, of, of, of women or men being confused or born into some sort of dysmorphia about their gender that it, it has become sort of almost a fashion, a fashion. and it's, yeah it's fashion fashion bearing bearing on a contagion yeah I, I think that's exactly right and and i don't think that this is ultimately going to be good for people who do experience gender dysphoria because there will be if we have a generation of young women who are taking hormone blockers, obviously it's not going to be everybody in this case, but there's a, this is incredibly widespread. Um, and if we have a generation of women who, who go through this and have some regret later, that's probably going to be used to make it more difficult for trans people to get healthcare. And that's also a problem. Um, so, you know, and I, I do think there is some conflict between sort of old school 
tra people who would have been considered transsexuals, um, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, people who have genuine, you know, body dysphoria, who are well served by transitioning, and this sort of newer political generation where you don't have to necessarily have dysphoria. Um, it can, you can microdose testosterone. That's a new thing that people are doing. Um, it's incredibly easy to get top surgery and, and, and testosterone. All you have to do is go to Planned Parenthood and tell them that you're trans and they'll give it to you. Um, but yeah, this is, a, this is a thing that is happening. And my interest in this is that this is apparently something that we're not supposed to talk about. You know, you're not, and just five years ago, the New York Times would have probably published opinion pieces on things like this. Today, I, I don't think that they would. Um, you know, and if there is, if there are mass numbers of, of, of females, specifically homosexual females who no longer want to be women, something is going on here. Um, and we're supposed to just sort of pretend like, oh, this is just, you know, embrace your identity. This is just born this way. You're all well, just, you're, you're you're exactly right. And look what's happening to women's sports. Right. If we normalize having, uh, well, I, I have to be correct in my terminology, but you have women, who, men who have transitioned to women. So what do you call them? Trans women. Trans women on sports teams. I have seen the photographs. I, I can't see how it wouldn't be the end of women's. Well, let me, let me, I was going to raise that because. And, and that's come back, by the way, because that was one of Joe Biden's executive. Well, that's orders controversial. To yeah. Yeah. Sure. It's a little more complex. It's yeah. more complex. But, but that's that's definitely the thrust of where this wants to go. Um, but so, so part of me gets like hysterical and says, you know, after all these years of fighting for women's spaces, women's rights, women's sports. Oh, you know, here we go. Uh, it's going to be, you know, taken over by men. On the other hand, how how. Is that really going to happen? Like, I also don't want to get overly paranoid yeah. um, that you get one one trans woman on a sports team. Yeah. Um, I like how how common is that really going to be? I guess. How big a yeah. problem is that really going to be? I don't think it's going to be a ma I don't think this is the end of women's sports. I don't think that there will be large numbers of, of males transitioning or just say they're transitioning just purely to get a women's scholarship. I don't think that's going to be, I don't think that's going to happen. It might, things are crazy. It could happen. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you do have these isolated cases, like in Connecticut, you have these track stars, two or three of whom are trans women. Um, and I don't think that they, in Connecticut, I, as far as I know, you don't have to, to have taken any sort of um, any sort of puberty block blockers or anything like that. So these, Trans women have gone through male puberty. They're tra they're the best runners in this. They're the best yeah. women runners in the yeah. state. Yeah, you know, for the there's a lawsuit. You know, for the girls who are losing out on on opportunities. Yes, this is a this is a, a giant deal for the rest of us. You know, I don't really give a shit about sports anyway. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> yeah, but as you say, and, but it also it, and and going back to your larger theme, it's it's going into this. Um, I mean, I feel there's just underlying misogyny to all of yeah, them. yeah. Uh, that it's it's telling biological women you can't define who is a woman. You you don't know what a woman is. Um, it's negating actual experience of women, right? Um, in order to create this new definition um that sort of as you say with uh, non-binary makes it irrelevant makes these right. traits either side of sort of fossilizes them in one like this this is a woman or just says what you have to say is irrelevant about me it, right. it's, it's disturbing right you know and this stuff has has really crept so quickly. Yeah. Chief Strangio, the ACLU, ACLU lawyer who is, um, I'm not sure what his exact title is, but he's sort of the famous trans one for the ACLU. He was tweeting last week or the week before, if a trans woman, uh, basically saying biological sex doesn't exist. If a trans woman is on a woman's sports team, it's still a women's sports team because trans women are biological females and have always been biological females, which is, completely nonsensical. If a trans woman were a biological woman, why would she transition? So part to me, part of this is, is that's part of the reason I, I like this stuff annoys me because it's, so it's incoherent. It's so incoherent. It's so, it's so inconsistent. And you're telling us something that is 
patently false that 99% of the world is going to disagree with. And we're all supposed to just like clap and say like, yes, trans women are women. It's as though these platitudes have become these laws that you're no longer allowed to question. And personally, I don't like being told what I'm supposed to believe. Um, and I will never believe that, you know, someone born biologically male was actually born biologically female. This is just not how the world works. You wouldn't need to transition if, if that were the case, you know, and I have lots of trans friends who are you know, slightly older, who also think that this is ridiculous. You know, people like Buck Angel, who of course is considered a turf and a transphobe, um, even though he was one of the earliest, the earliest uh, trans men to get surgery in the United States. He really was a groundbreaker. Um, and he's just sort of written off as- going, to, going back to what we were talking about the media, is if we could have an intelligent discussion and some genuine debates, then either if they, if in fact they do have a good point and they are moving us towards a, you know, higher level of enlightenment, then a lot of us would be persuaded. Sure. But what bothers me is that we're not allowed to have the debate. Right. We're not allowed to have dissidents. You are immediately targeted and called names and, and denigrated for being transphobic simply because you raise questions. Right. And that shuts down the conversation. It, it's it, once you start with ad hominem attacks, it just stops the conversation. And this is an experience I have all the time. My co-host, Jesse Single, has also sort of been, uh, there have been attempts to cancel both of us because of our positions on trans issues, both of which are actually very liberal. Jesse, even more so than me, Jesse's in favor of, of pediatric transition. Um, I think we need to be a little bit more cautious about it, but, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, probably, we're probably to the left of the average American on these issues. And almost daily, someone will accuse Jesse or I of being transphobic. And I'll say, okay, show me the line, show me the, show me the comment, show me the thing that, that either one of us has said that, that demonstrates our transphobia. And nobody can ever do it, it because it do doesn't it. exist. It doesn't exist. And instead of, of, of that making somebody think and say like, wait a second, if I can't find this evidence for, for, you know, for the existence of this transphobia, maybe it doesn't exist. All they do is double down and say like, fuck you turf. You know, that's the, that's the response. Um, so you can't change people's minds on this, even, even when faced with the evidence, they just cannot be, cannot, cannot sort of come around. Well, that's a whole other issue is this group of, uh, women, uh, who they call turfs. Yeah. Um, and, I have watched that debate and now I've befriended many of the TERFs and some of them are people I fought a long time ago because they were radical feminists and they hated men and I was defending men. Uh, But now I, I'm an ally because of the way they have been silenced and they're deplatformed in its absolute censorship of a Mm -hmm. whole group of, of, in, in, in even among philosophers. There are long, you know, letters signed by multiple philosophers, you know, wanting to silence uh, uh, women who are raising questions about. Well, let me let me go. Let me go further. I'm going to go there. So we have we've had a whole bunch of cases and they weirdly, they are usually women. I don't know why, who have impersonated black women. Mm -hmm. We've had Hilaria Baldwin, who has impersonated Spanish. Women. I believe Hilaria. <laughs> <laughs> I hashtag believe women. I believe hash, women. Hashtag believe Hilaria, which is hilarious. Um, <laughs> why? And they are canceled. They, that's it. They, this is like the worst thing you can possibly do. So why isn't this true with some people who just say they're women and they want to identify they with women? appropriate all of our suffering. Right. Then, right. then why? Why is this like not sexual appropriation. Why is this not sexual appropriation or even? Yeah. Okay. So my, like my, like steel man answer for that is that we know that gender dysphoria is a medical condition is something that maybe exists in the brain, maybe something people are born with, right, right, right. but it's in the DSM. Right. So that would be right. my sort of steel man argument right. here is that, that, that transgender people are you can't say that this is like Ben Shapiro saying that they have a mental illness. It is a mental gender dysphoria is listed in the DSM. It is a mental illness a disorder. And that, and we don't know that that equivalent works for racial dysphoria. Right. That said, 
The concept of race is much fuzzier and uh, and more malleable than the concept of sex, right? right? With the exception of rare intersex people, you are either male or female. Race is way different. I think there's a compelling, uh, you can make a compelling argument that race doesn't exist at all. Um, as people like Thomas Chatterton Williams and Camille Foster make, you know, there's this thing that sort of loosely maps onto to ethnicity, but it is incredibly easy. It, it, it's It's possible for, you know, a black man and a white woman to have Swedish looking children. Are those children still black? You know, that's sort of the question here. Um, so it is very, it is very inconsistent that the, we know that gender dysphoria exists. We know that biological sex exists. Race is, is probably more of a social construct. You know, as people like to think of, of gender as a social construct. But with the identification um, of, of, of women, uh, when you're trying to identify as such, you're just projecting. And, and I agree, there are people who are, gen, I mean, and that was a small percentage and, and it was a psychiatric or whatever, biologically you were born gender dysphoric, but we're not talking about that. Right. We're talking about people who just want to identify as women. Right, right. Um, they're not, gen, they would not be in any way in any of the psychiatric books categorized as gender dysphoric. It's a, it's a whole debate within, uh, within the queer community about this. People who think that you have to have gender dysphoria to be considered trans or called true scum, which is not a term of endearment. Wow. Uh, yeah. If you think that you need to have undergone through, uh, you know, hormones or surgery, then you're a, a trans medicalist, also not a term of endearment. Oh my God. Yeah. It's all, it's, it becomes so difficult to talk about these things because there's just too many words, too many idiotic labels. I think too many academics have yeah. driven this debate. It didn't, it's not like a, a, a social movement, a, a civil rights movement that came from the, the, you know, just it rose up because there was this call for it. A lot of it was created, manufactured by, but, by, by neurotics. Right. But how does it play out in the end? I mean, is this just a fashion? Is this just another craze we're going through? And then two years from now? Yeah. But in the past, a completely there would be different crazes, thing. but right. you had an intellectual establishment in the universities or in journalism. In, in, I don't in know. I don't that know. That had some integrity. Now they won't, they can't say no. There's they always can't. been this, I think, to some degree. There, there is this, of, I, I, we did a show last week on, uh, on satanic panic and, right, the memory, right. and the repressed memory wars, the memory wars of the That's 90s. what I was thinking of too. Right, right. And so, and we, we interviewed a guy named Ethan Waters who wrote a book called um, Making Monsters, which is this, fantastic book about the memory wars and right. and what he, he the parallel we did not prompt him to say this and i was sort of wondering if it would come up but we were asking about parallels and one of the things that he told us was that during the memory wars you couldn't question the existence of of, of uh, repressed and recovered memories without major backlash within within the field, right. within right. the media. You can, and and i was a kid during this so you you guys would re remember it better than i would. But it was just accepted it was just assumed that this thing was true that you could have a traumatic experience immediately forget about it and then recall it you know 10 or 20 years later in perfect recall that's not how memory works we know this um you know huge horrible consequences for this including people going for jail for crimes not just they didn't commit but crimes that didn't take place at all um and so ethan was telling us he said you know where I see one of the parallels is, is the conversation about gender identity. And the same thing exists where if you go to a therapist, um, it's possible you might not have any, any symptoms of gender dysphoria, but you say, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a woman and I like male things. And your therapist says, well, have you considered that you might be trans? So that's one angle where that's one right. parallel. And also then another parallel is that the same, the same resistance to, um, the resistance to sort of inspection, um, where if you if you're the person questioning this, standing up on you know on a rooftop saying, "Wait a second, here, guys, all of you cannot be trans. This is impossible. This defies logic." Then you know you're the heretic. Um, and I asked Ethan, you know, how did this end? How did Satanic Panic end? And he said, "Well, you know, there's all of these lawsuits, and these things sort of naturally." go through cycles. And I do think that's true. You can look at that human history and see lots of cycles of moral panics. Um, I think that's what's happening now. As for how it ends, that's the question. I think lawsuits might be a part of it is more and more people sue their practitioners, although it is somehow, right. when, sometimes when, very difficult. When 14 and 16 year olds, I mean, I feel sorry for the parents in this because yeah. they are helpless. 
They yeah. are totally helpless. Yeah. And, they, and they may be well-meaning and they, oh, they're they usually, they're the, beyond they think, well-meaning. Oh, well, I have to, I have to allow these, these puberty blockers or I'm, I'm right. a monster. Or right. I, I, I have to support my 16 year old daughter's mastectomy. Right. Uh, right. I mean, it's, 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 it's very, very tough. Um, yeah. I also wonder how much this is a product of just messed up relations between young men and women and maybe young women and women, I don't want to exclude, but that um, I, I think as we know with Gen Z, there's never been a generation or, you know, in our recorded history that has had such little sex with each other um, right. who are, who are so depressed, who have such confused ideas about forming relationships, um, long-term relationships about marriage. Uh, I, I mean, that's, I, I have to feel that a lot of this is, especially for um, the younger women who are confused and adopting this because it feels safer right. than having to confront um, their own sexuality. And in a way it's a, it's a repression of female sexuality, or it's a, it's a statement that when a young woman starts to have all the insecurities and questions that we do as young, you know, as 13, 14, 15 year olds, the way that the, um, the, the, the therapeutical establishment is dealing with it is to shut it down. Yeah. It's to say, well, if you are having these insecurities, clearly it's not great to be a woman. You should become a man. Right. Like we're not dealing with the actual problems of being young women. Right. We are trying to redirect the conversation right. and shut it down. And, and, and then weirdly posit that being a young, uh, underscoring the idea that being a young woman sucks, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it does. It does. I mean, puberty is incredibly difficult for women. I don't know how it is for men, but it can be very difficult for women. And so if you're, you know, you know, you get online and you see these like cute, especially if you're a, like a young butch lesbian or regardless of whether you call yourself that or not, but if that's what you are, um, which is not exactly the, the highest tier of, of, uh, of, of society. And you get online and you watch these videos and there are all these sort of cute trans guys. And, uh, you know, they talk about how much better their lives are. Well, I can see that being totally, totally compelling. Um, you know, it's a way of, of dealing with maybe not the underlying problems, but um, sort of a putting putting a bandaid on your problems. Do you um, think you, you're, you, it, when you were young, if you imagine it was today, do you think your parents would have been told you were trans and you would have been told that you might want to transition? And I, I do. And I've thought about this a lot. So I don't know what my parents would have done because my dad is a was a. Uh, hum, uh, human sexuality professor. Um, that's part of what he did. And so he's much more aware of the data on this stuff than the average, than the average American is. Um, so he would have been able to say, to like, look at the studies and talk to sexologists and clinicians and say, what's really going on. Do I think I would have demanded it? Hell yeah. Um, and so I could, Katie, be, uh, do you think you would have, as you self-described butch lesbian, do you think yeah. you would have thought about becoming a man? Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially if all of my friends were doing it. Um, and all of my friends are doing it. They're just like, they're in their thirties and forties and doing it now, as opposed to. What, what stops teenagers. you from doing it? What would, what would, what I'm not, think? I don't have gender dysphoria. I'm happy to be a woman. I, I'd be a five foot six man. I'd probably go bald really quickly. I, you know, once you start taking hormones, you also go through second puberty. So you usually like your skin gets terrible, your voice. It's just, it's not who I am. Um, you know, my my breasts aren't large enough so that I think that top surgery is like is something that would improve my life all that much. Um, but yeah, I, that's just not who I am. I'm not a, I'm not a follower. I'm not I'm not into group think and I'm not into doing what the people around me are doing. Um, but I cannot tell you the number of people I know who who have who have had top surgery in the past few years. It's in the dozens. I play this little game now where if I haven't seen someone in a while or heard from someone in a while, I'll like go to their Twitter profile or their Facebook or Instagram and I'll look and see if their pronouns have changed yet. And I always guess yes. And I'm always right. Um, and I'm not talking about people just in their 50, you know, in their Are they happier as men? I mean, the, the other thing is like, you know, we get well, but we're happy. So why That's, I mean, I think some are and some aren't because you're still yourself. Um, won't make all of your problems go away. Sometimes it just creates new ones. 
uh, yeah, I think for some people, it's probably a great decision. And then for others, it's a terrible one. You know, and uh, there's a lot of people... I, I know a lot more people who are doing the non-binary thing than have fully medically transitioned. Um, but, you know, I've had some friends who, when I ask them to explain to me what's going on, they'll say things like, I wanted to take my top off at the beach. That's why I, that's why I got a double mastectomy. And to me, you know, oh. the appropriate, if you want to take your shirt off at, at the beach, I think the appropriate response is to figure out the local laws. In Seattle, it's legal for women to take their top or off. Or go to France. Yeah. Go to France. Change <laughs> society. Change society. I, yeah. uh, I want to ask inappropriate questions. Sure. You're a lesbian uh -huh. and now you're an official like white male privileged. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're, and we're... We're Jews. We're now privileged. Yeah, we don't we're count. All privileged. Everybody so, yeah. who's calling you privileged is also privileged. Can we yes, just be clear just about that? Yeah. Entre nous, we yeah. can ask inappropriate questions. Is there? Is that? It, this is a stupid question, but I can't help but ask: Is there any man that you ever could lust like Brad Pitt <laughs> comes and just like <laughs> Haiti, and he, he takes you her. in his arms? You know, it me. depends how much tequila I had. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm, I am, you know, I'm not blind. I'm not, uh, I, I'm probably like a, a 5.75 on the Kinsey scale. So I can see, it's not like I don't see men. I don't have face blindness. Um, I can tell when they're attractive. Um, I just, you know, I prefer them as friends. <laughs> I think they prefer <laughs> me as friends too. I guess I'd say that about women. I mean, you say like if Catherine Deneuve, like, wanted to kiss me i mean maybe but whoa you uh, heard it on the film yeah, maybe. i mean I, I do think that female sexuality is much more fluid than male sexuality um and you can there's studies sort of showing this if you right. hook a woman up to electrodes and show her different parts of porn like different porn um you know women have a different biological response than men do um right and there used to be sort of like every college girl went through her lesbian phase in lesbian college. until graduation yeah. Yeah. no i didn't go to college so oh. i don't know <laughs> i just heard it i used to go to lesbian bars there was yeah. a bar in the village called the duchess and my college roommate and i we would go there just because we wanted to talk and be left alone yeah Oh, you went to a lesbian bar yeah. to be left alone? You? Yeah. <laughs> Are you? Not, no. Not entirely. <laughs> no, Joyce. You got... need to go to a gay bar to be left alone. Yes. They don't want you there, though. Yeah. They don't want you there. They love you. You I, sing. You no, sing. I'm. Is that so? I want one thing that I want for social progress is a better word for. Can I say fag hag? I, I give you permission. Yeah. But, okay. But that's not a nice word. But I am the original you F are. hag. You and Liza Minnelli. Yeah. And gay bars. I was I was there. You were beloved I gay could bars. sing and I had a high soprano and they needed that. So I was in the, all the piano bars in New York. But I would go to the Duchess with Joyce. And the, the more or less, we were left alone. She was this little hot. I mean, you couldn't go anywhere with Joyce. And the men were interfering, interrupting. We just wanted to talk. So we'd go there. There were great lesbian bars in the village and it was cool. And but they've gone now. You said they're like all the lesbian bars are vanishing. There are 15 left in America. There are. So there are queer bars. Which what about the Lilith sort of, Fair? Did you ever go to the Lilith? I never I never went to Lilith Fair, but I you know, the real the big event, the big lesbian event was a Michigan Women's Music Festival, which existed for like 30 years. And it also closed down because of it not being exclusive of uh, inclusive yeah. of trans trans identities. Okay, something Camille um, Polly has said, mm -hmm. and I've always wondered about. She said gay males are associated with the highest expression culture. You know, mm -hmm. they're the, the playwrights and the, you know, Leonard Bernstein, and you go through the the Wait, history he of poetry. What? Leonard Bernstein was gay? Oh my God. So. Okay. Okay. We'll talk. We'll discuss later. We'll discuss. <laughs> he was so gay. But he was by. Oh, OK, actually. OK, go on. OK. And she, he said it, you find gay males in, you know, fashion designers, art historians, opera, the oh, yeah. whole world of the high art culture. Art world is lousy. With high them, culture. Lesbians, she said, softball. <laughs> <laughs> so mean. <laughs> She, yeah. Uh, she's, yeah, she seems to hate her own people, right. uh, which I Yeah, she gets that. mad at her own people. Uh, right. Which I do, too. I do, too. So what's up with that? Now, I think, to be fair, you could probably go back. It 
maybe the gay males were more out and the female, the lesbians were just more hidden. I'm simply wondering how you react to that. It's just. Well, I think there's probably like everything else, what's going on is some sort of combination of, of biology and, and, and culture. Um, you know, maybe there's something to, to the fact that I'm, and I'm totally speculating here. Maybe lesbians are more likely to have higher testosterone levels and gay males are more likely to have higher estrogen levels. And that sort of loosely maps onto, onto interest. Maybe it's just purely cultural. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I've this, always thought that I thought it might be that combination of a feminine sensibility and male mm-hmm. aggression. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so gay males well, have ma- that. Male creative geniuses are homosexual or non-homosexual. Um, you know, if we can talk about male correct, male characteristics have that absolute sense of drive and they can obliterate everything else in their life and be devoted to their craft in ways that women historically have not been able to. Right. You got to didn't kids. want to. Yeah. Right. Or didn't want yeah. to. No. And I'm not saying it's, it's, I mean, in some cases it might be oppression or sexism, but a lot of it is just, it's not what we do. And we, we have kids and we, Okay, another thing Andrew Sullivan has said. She's just re- she's just getting I'm she's just, getting them I'm all just out, Katie. Channel, channeling Andrew, I like it. <laughs> uh, he tells this joke, and everybody's heard it a million times about you know. Uh, oh, I can't even tell it. I'm a woman. I can't tell the joke. Um, what ha- what happens? Uh, uh, what's the difference between a lesbian and a gay male second date? The gay male. What second date? <laughs> and the lesbian brings the U-Haul. You bring your your U-Haul. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. True or false? Uh, I, in my experience, I have uh, you know my wife and I. Let's see, she moved in with me, but we waited like a month, I think, before before she moved in. Um, but yes, we do we do tend to U-Haul. The stereotypes exist for a reason. So so that, so that's an interesting test of male female differences. If you look at gay culture, right. where there's a lot of promiscuity yeah. and uh, uh, detached unemotional sex, let's be honest. And lesbians, it's there's more cuddling, right? Well, you don't see like there's no there's never been a successful like women like women's hookup app, right? Like gay men will find each other in a park and drop their pants. Yeah. Women don't do that. And probably that is also probably, you know, a byproduct of culture of nature and nurture where it is true that women have to be, um, you know, are just more in, inherently um, at Selective. risk. And yeah, and and selective. Yeah, absolutely. You know, maybe maybe selective because at risk. Right, right. But, but you don't see there was a, a for a while for a brief amount of time there was a a a, a woman's hookup app, but they named it Brenda. Um, so, I don't know. <laughs> it's like you mentioned that was like the worst name it's ever. Who name. wants to hang with Brenda? Nobody. Nobody. Brenda. Sorry, or, Brenda's. Sorry for any Brenda's Karen. Karen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That, that's our app. Yeah. That's the app we're on. Obviously. Well, one thing that's interesting is that you have these like like Judas Butler is now transgender. Masha Gessen, transgender. It suddenly became trans, these Kimberly Pierce, these women or these four, you know, females, let's say former women who were sort of proud feminists, proud out lesbians are not just, you know, eschewing their lesbian identity, they're eschewing their, their female identity. And I find that really, uh, Eileen Miles also now trans. I find that really fascinating, you know, that these, that these, these people who would have been sort of paragons of feminism are now don't want to be women anymore. There's a powerful force in Western culture to eliminate the feminine, beginning with Plato's Republic. And initially, a lot of feminists thought, oh, this is Plato wanted to eliminate the sex difference. And men and women who, who were going to be the leaders, the highest, most enlightened class in his republic, trained together naked because he just wanted to eliminate any any notice of a sex mm-hmm. difference. And for a while, feminist philosophers thought that he was maybe the first feminist until a few came along and thought, well, not exactly. He kind of wants us out of the picture. Right. Well, just he was not, gay, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. and that's and that's and 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 just to wind this up, but to say that that this idea that defaming the feminine, um, that not being comfortable as a lesbian, being a woman, feeling you have to be a man. And that goes back to what feminists always got mad about 
although they promoted that the superior thing was to be more like men. Yeah. Right. That, that right. if we went to, to the office, we had to act like men. Right. And yeah. wear a tie and shoulder pads. Wear the, the, the old tie and shoulder pads and, and, and cut that ourselves my first off. Argument. That was my first argument with my feminist colleague because I wanted to be girly. And I didn't think it was inconsistent with being an academic and being analytical. But you could be. Right. But, but we had to we had to mimic men's lives rather than figuring out right. what would a woman look like in this space successfully. Right. All right. Well, Katie, you've been such a great sport. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It's great thank to talk much. to you both. Oh, it's such a thrill to have you on. And and, and so great to meet you finally, even if virtually. Um, so we didn't th- talk about lazy podcasters. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I am. One. Hey, so just as a reminder, for those of you um, who are not Patreon subscribers, we're you're going to miss the best part. You're going to miss do- We have the best part when we do our Patreon only. We call it last call monthly episode. We go to the Izzy room. Yeah, Izzy is here and she's been quiet. We have a dog in the studio. And, Katie, and Izzy is transitioning. Izzy is transitioning. <laughs> no, I'm serious. People laugh, but she is a, a male dog in a female body. And I, Izzy's gender male? dysphoria is real. What? Yeah, it is. It is. Well, well moose too. She's moose. Like, uh, it, does Moose have gender dysphoria? Well, Moose has, so not yet. I'm, I'm going to give it to him soon because I'm, <laughs> I'm working on this. I'm working on a newsletter about, about spaying and neutering. It's called Moose Nuggets. It's a sub stack. <laughs> um, and it's, and it, it's a four part series and it's about why, uh, like sort of the history and, and, and the science behind spaying and neutering, which actually is more interesting than it's I heard part of the podcast. I don't know where, maybe I forget where you were, maybe your own podcast explaining this. Yeah. Because everyone has a rescue, a rescue, right. like now the new elite. And Izzy is um, a dog that is bespoken from a particular breeder and all that. Right. But it turns out that these rescues are being imported from right. uh, Venezuela. Venezuela. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ukraine. Dog it's breeders like we don't, we in don't Ukraine. Have enough, like Ukraine. We don't have enough rescues in the area. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to, so the process of this is, uh, I'm trying to decide whether Moose, um, I should, I should spare or neuter him or not. And somebody asked me what I was leaning towards recently. And I said, well, I think I might, I'm not going to neuter him. So we're going to keep his balls, but I'm going to cut off his penis. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it's about. so hideous. A dog. It's hideous. It's hideous. It's just hideous. really Let's aesthetic. It. Okay, yeah. guys, we're ending this. Guys, I just, okay, guys, I'm sorry. Okay, that's a micro. We're ending, we're ending this here before we get into dog penises. Fortunately, <laughs> Izzy doesn't have that. Yeah. Well, and that's not in the picture. Okay. Literally. Okay. Okay. Can I say again, Katie, how lovely it was to have you on. <laughs> Subscribe, come to patreon.com slash famsplainers, support the podcast, and you get this bonus conversation with Katie. So thanks, Katie. Thank you for having me. The new year is a time for resolutions. Most people's usually involve diet and weight goals, and I know mine do. What about your mental health? Setting targets for happiness and satisfaction in your daily life or for achieving a dream is at least as important as your diet, and it may be now more important than ever. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. And there is a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. And the service is in fact available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor, and you'll get timely and thoughtful responses Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. As even now, more important than ever when you can't even get to a doctor's office. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. Visit betterhelp.com slash femsplainers. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health 
the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and FemSplainer listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash femsplainers. That's betterhelp.com slash femsplainers. Check it out now. You deserve it. What a, what a thoroughly delightful person. <laughs> She's one of my favorite people. Yeah. I just adore her. She's an original, just so exuberant and courageous and smart. I'm always admiring of people who think themselves out of their natural prejudices. Right. I think if there's ever a lesson to learn from our time is, and I, I mean, I take what you guys were saying about the media, but I think it has always been true that you have to find the people you trust to follow and you read and you, you just, as with anything, you have to be a discerning consumer. Well, like you, you, one would automatically include the New York Times as biased media, except that some of my favorite journalists are at the New York Times. I know. And, that's and why I know they are there quietly doing their job, doing great journalism against increasing. But maybe not so quietly, too, that that um, what I think is funny is that, you know, when you look on the right, they have had the powers of government. <laughs> They've had the power at one point of, con you know, both levels of Congress, the presidency, Fox News, by the way, all local news stations through OAN, and that they whine about like the New York Times is biased. I, th I think well, it's just crazy. Okay. I think in their, just, on their side, it's true. They have that, but then but no, major, but and major with, cultural institutes, the universities, the, the well, that's uh, true. elementary but, schools. Silicon Valley journalism. Okay, but seems so the, the main thing them. is, is we have to be discerning consumers of the information. And by the way, I think we also have to be discerning tweeters and conveyors of information. That that's the other thing. Is that a criticism? No. no. Are you joining my family? No, no, no. My actually, this members. is this is a point that um, my husband David Frum is always saying, and he, uh, but I, I really agree with it that. We are all now our own media organizations. So whenever you share something on Facebook or yeah. Twitter or um, I can't believe, what are you doing with, you're holding Izzy up like Lion King. What are you doing? Okay. I'm just trying to make her comfortable. Okay. Because she's, Izzy her, her remains in the blockers. studio. <laughs> no, she's transitioning and she, she has puberty blockers and, and I will defend her right to have them. Izzy was just, there were times in that interview I thought, okay, this is over because Izzy was looking at us like, it's over. I'm ready to go get out of that chair. And I, I, I feel your pain, Izzy. But anyway, we all have to be responsible about the information that we are recirculating. And that's how we get into these issues on Facebook and things where people are retweeting crazy conspiracy things, because I think the big test is if you see something that you really, 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 really agree with, question it. Because there's a lot of stuff out of there that is just playing into your sensibility. And, and, and social media algorithms have become very, look, they know what I want to buy online. My Instagram is nothing but a feed of things I want to buy. Well, How do they what? find I'm me? I'm happy about that. No, I, I know, used to but... get advertisements for like horrible shoes. <laughs> and now they've. Now... Right. But, but the same people who are sending you exactly the right shoe that you want to buy are sending you exactly the right opinion that you want to consume. And that's what's so important is to realize, you know what? I like this too much. Something can't be right here. And, and anyway, that's all I would say. That's all I would say. No, I agree with you. I, we all have this horrible confirmation bias. But I check out my biases and they turn out to be right. <laughs> all right. Well, it's been an utter thrill for me to, to, to have you back on the podcast. I always love it when you, when you pop in. I as pop it were, in. You pop and in. And I'm sorry that certain people acted out a little bit. Um, I hope we didn't say anything we regret in the Odds okay, past. I can edit it out. Edit out. And you guys missed a great conversation. Lesbian. For did I mention lesbian bed death? What is lesbian bed death? Never mind. What? I think I brought it up. No, you did not bring it up. 
this is also, can I just say, we don't usually have wine in the studio these days. And, yeah. and she was on pot. I <laughs> Katie was on pot. That was revealed in the Patreon. It was revealed in the Patreon. I don't know how people function on pot. Like, like I know I they would sleep not on function. pot. I mean, I have like me, a, just the right mix of Adderall and wine. I can go. But if I have pot, it would be, wow. I'd just be laughing at my hand. Anyway, <laughs> all right. It would be laughing at Izzy. Didn't we do that on New Year's Eve? Yeah, we did. We, we had laughed edibles, at our shoes. And we were laughing at our shoes. Our shoes were so interesting. They were comical. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and look forward to see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. The Femsplainers is a weekly podcast carried on the Ricochet Network and available pretty much on every podcast platform. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and watch video of our interviews on YouTube. You'll find links to everything, plus how to contact us directly at femsplainers.com. We survive and depend on your support. Like the show? Consider donating as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash femsplainers. And get our exclusive monthly bonus episode, Last Call, in which you get to join the conversation with our guests. And there's much more. And a big shout out of thanks to our audio and video editor, Nat Frum. <laughs>